Hello everybody, I'm Bart Massey. Welcome once again to Computer Sound and Music. Today we're going to talk about tuning and temperament, which is one of these topics that's really arcane a little bit, even by musician standards, but can be really interesting in the world of computer audio in particular. Hope everybody's doing well out there. Let's go ahead and get started. So. I want to thank, before I start, Brian Ginsberg, who did this lecture previously and has graciously allowed me to use his notes, Thank you very, as well as some of his software. Thank you very much for that, Brian. I really appreciate it. So what are pitches? What are intervals? We've talked about these a little bit, but it's worth reviewing. Pitch is sort of how we hear a tone right it's the frequency of the tone fundamentally uh but you know our hearing plays a big role in pitch as we've talked about an interval is the difference between in pitch between two tones we've talked about that too it's you know typically expressed in scale steps or half steps between one tone and another and this is where chords come from so we've talked a little bit about chords and that makes it easier to talk about this topic and as we've said a bunch of times, we know how to make octaves. We know that an octave at 440, above 440 hertz would be 880 hertz. And so octaves, as we've talked about when we talked about chords, are kind of fundamental things because notes that are the same up to octave are perceived to be very, very similar notes. And again, intervals, uh, if we want the fifth above some number, then we do this two to the twelfth power thing. So if we want a fifth above 440 hertz, then we go 440 times two to the uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven twelfths. And that gives us this amount that's about 660 hertz above. And about here, that 660 is not all that accurate. But, you know, maybe we should, instead of thinking about this equal temperament 2 to the 12th thing that we've been doing all this time, I've kept hinting at the fact that that's going to be a approximation to the real thing, but maybe we should instead sort of think about it in terms of ratios between small whole numbers. And there's an important reason to do that, but in that case, then, you know, we'll make this 660 exact, we'll say a fifth is going to be a three halves interval and an octaves will be a two to one interval and that has some reasoning the the idea here is this idea of sonority octaves that because you know think of sine waves as reinforcing or canceling each other right if and think about the period of that. If I have an octave, a two to one sound, then you know the 440 here goes for uh, goes in a 440th of a second through a sine wave. The 880 goes in a 440th of a second through two sine waves, and so the tone's going to sound really super pure because the whole period of that signal is about 440. Where a tone quits sounding pure is where you can hear variation over time scales that are large enough for your ear to hear them. And for things like the perfect, the octave or the perfect fifth at three over two, right? Now the period of variance of that is six cycles. It's still very short, right? the the 
the uh, over six cycles it repeats which is still way too short for your ear to hear at reasonable frequencies and so it sounds a clear pure pristine stable tone at that point the farther we get from those ratios that have a small least common multiple the more that it starts to get into the realm where you can actually hear the waves beating against each other or otherwise making repetitive patterns that are long enough for your ear to hear, that's not going to sound good anymore. And also because our Western ear has been trained so long and so carefully, we've been trained to hear certain intervals as consonant and other ones as dissonant. And it's hard to sort those two things out. And so as we start getting to weirder things, this plan of using fractions sort of starts to break down. And that was what we wanted to not do. We didn't want to uh, have some notes that sound really off and some notes that sound right on. And that's why we split things in this equal temperament way to begin with. It sort of spreads the area fairly evenly over the entire octave. Not perfectly, but fairly evenly from these whole number ratios. And so the ones that would have really strange things, because they have very long least common multiples, they aren't so, you know, they aren't so different from the ones that aren't. And that's sort of the key idea in this tuning thing. So, yeah, this, I got a little ahead of the slides here, but absolutely. Uh, so, you know, if you look at a, a tritone, a, a thing that's four steps up, um, it's going to be, sorry, what's up? It's going to be, uh, super dissonant because you know nine times five is 45 eight times eight is 64 they have literally no things so the period of that's going to be really long it's going to be like 2400 cycles 2500 cycles and so it's going to be long enough that things really sound dissonant and weird and that's going to be sort of yeah if you've ever tuned a guitar by sort of harmonic matching we can grab a guitar and do that actually oh so there's this idea there's this idea on the guitar strings that says that if I play this oh I can't play it very well that's a harmonic if you can hear it of um, E and this is a note that's the same note as a harmonic of the A string. And if the guitar's out of tune, hear all that wavery bits? That says this guitar's out of tune that, and you aren't gonna be able to, you, so you're gonna have a problem I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time making it loud enough for the microphone. And as you uh, tune the guitar, you can make it worse or better. And when it sounds like those two notes are beating together, that means that they have you know, when it sounds smooth, that means there's a, a good, those notes are sort of matched and not canceling each other out. And that's when the guitars, two guitar strings are mostly in tune. You can kind of go up the scale like that. And that's a great example of sort of what we're doing here. So, you know, like I say, we took this 12 tone equal temperament, this temperament where we just take all 11 half steps up from the thing and make them the same distance apart. Everything's the same distance apart. And, you know, it's close to the whole number ratios we would use, but it's not right. And uh, so 12 tone equal temperament is that, and that's the game we're playing.
why 440 let's let's do that as an aside because you know what a weird what a weird number to pick is sort of the 440 hertz a and the history of that is um long and complicated and weird and the short version is you have to pick something and because you want to be able to bring different instruments in and have them play you know on the same scale and because you want to be able to uh reproduce music you know you, you want to be able to mix things that were done different places and stuff like that you have to pick something the 440 ended up being it there's a interesting video uh that adam neely has on t making fun of the whole 432 tuning systems that i can highly recommend but anyway orchestras it turns out don't always tune to 440 uh, if there's this tendency for the bass frequency to creep, creep upward from 440 because instruments sound better at a little bit higher frequencies and so you know there's nothing magic about 440 it's just a number we picked a long time ago so let's go back to our plan our earlier plan of instead of equal tempering things we'll try to pick good whole number ratios for these notes that are close to equal temperament but have smaller least common multiples and uh yeah it's it was an old chinese tuning is the first record we have of equal temperament and you know everybody thinks it must be western but it's not and but they kind of abandoned it at some point and in recent centuries everybody got excited we've talked about the reasons why they got excited about going back to equal temperament because it allows you to modulate to change keys and you don't have any problems with that um whereas with just intonation something that's perfect whole number ratios in the key on an a scale let's say uh, they aren't perfect anymore if you start on some different note because things aren't spaced equally far apart which is interesting so we've talked about harmonics in this class a lot of this is review we've talked about harmonics in this class and harmonics are, in, are integer multiples of some of the free, fundamental frequency and we've talked about that when you distort a sine wave or otherwise generate the sine wave in some weird way you're likely to get a lot of these harmonics and you know those the harmonics that in particular you're likely to get are overtones they're higher in frequency than the fundamental and we've talked very early on in, about the way that different instruments have different harmonic things the way that different waveforms have different harmonic content so harmonics are a big deal and the other you know so the sort of rationalist justification for this just intonation thing is what i've talked about beats and dissonance and stuff the fact of the matter is that the earliest just tuning we have one that uses smallest you know sort of small whole number ratios is pythagorean the the pythagoreans the followers of the teachings of pythagoras in ancient greece used a tuning system where whole number ratios paid a big part and you could argue that was not necessarily just because they had some deep understanding of Fourier's theorem it's because whole numbers were a whole thing with the Pythagorean whole numbers and whole number ratios were a whole thing with the Pythagoreans so another thing we've briefly mentioned before we tend to take the equal tempered scale and divide it into hundreds so on either side of you know the distance from one note to the next note you know one half step up interval is divided into a hundred parts and we call those cents and a cent isn't quite perceptible so it's a really good unit five cents is 
perceptible to some people, 10 cents is perceptible to a lot of people. So it gives us some measure of how far we off we are off where we want to be. And so it might be worth asking, well, how different are the just ratios that we use from the perfect intervals? So this header is actually wrong. It should say, uh, oh no, this is just interval in cents, right? So, and here's 12 tet in cents. So, you know, this is 200 cents from the from the major from the root, this is 203.91 cents from the root. So it's a ways off, it's really not right. But that nine to, and that nine to eight ratio means we are gonna have a long cycle anyway. It's gonna sound dissonant no matter what we do, so maybe that doesn't matter so much. A perfect fourth is about two cents shy of where, it's, where equal temperament would put it. A perfect fifth is about two cents long from where an equal temperament would put it. A major sixth is quite a bit off there again, and that should be a five to three ratio according to just interval, just intonation, which is, you know, so it's a big deal that it's 16 cents off almost. So that's a problem. And the octaves fortunately are perfect in both these systems. It's interesting, Keeping octaves at two to one is very, very important to people designing these alternate tunings. And I read a paper recently where somebody was arguing about a slight stretching of the octave making everything better overall. But I think, I don't know what musician, you know, what serious musicians would, re how they would react to this because they really do count on the octaves sounding good. So there's some pieces here, there are links in the notes and uh, I'm not gonna play them, but it's worth going to YouTube and finding some interesting <coughs> just intonation music and trying to understand how different it sounds. In particular, variants on just intonation were really popular in the 1600s and 1500s with the harpsichord and clavichord and it, one of the things as a kid that i found really fascinating I, I used to love listening to harpsichord when it would come up in class or whatever and then i would listen to piano stuff and think wow the piano's kind of a not doesn't sound so good i really think a lot of that wasn't just the difference in tone between the instruments it was that the harpsichord had this really nice tuning and the music was all written to work well with just intonation and so everything was cool. Here's some other, you know, so this is, so there's certain variants on this that float around a lot. You can go to, this is sort of the, what they call a three limit or two limit, three limit pentatonic. All these ratios are multiples of, you know, they, they have factors, the numerator and denominator have factors of two, three, and five. Uh, it's also common to go to a five limits scale, uh, two, three, five, seven, eleven, which uh, lets you more closely approximate things while still maintaining reasonably small ratios. But notice how much these are out. Nine over eight versus 21 over 20. 21 over 20 is a pretty dissonant tone. And yeah, one of the things that happens, Brian's absolutely right about this, when people are like, wow, this just intonation, it sounds so beautiful. How did us, our stupid, industrialized society ever get away from this and into some kind of cookie cutter tuning that's based on you know making everything sound the same and 
the big problems with that are the one we've already talked about, which is if you want to be able to change keys, which turns out to be a really powerful musical idea, then you're Im immediately going to start heading toward the bad part of the just scale where the ratios don't make any sense at all. And, you know, so imagine you modulate up a whole step from A to B or from C to D. Now your root tone is already, you know, one of these weird ratios from the root. And so all these other things are going to be weird. These intervals are going to start getting really long, really fast. And these chords are going to start sounding terrible. And also, you know, the way the game is played, and Brian's absolutely right about this, is that you want to have some dissonant intervals. It isn't just about getting rid of dissonance as though the best music is the most consonant sounding. You, you play, if you're a really serious music composer or musician, you play with that kind of dissonance versus consonance thing really super a lot. And so getting comfortable with a scale that allows you to be fairly consonant when you want to be across a wide range of things, well, I know which notes are the dissonant notes, and I can pick the ones I need to when I want to make a more dissonant sound. So, yeah. The... Yeah, if you... The, the whole business of commas and wolf intervals are absolutely interesting, and I highly recommend looking at them. So, yeah, so that's sort of in a nutshell what's going on. And the history we've already talked about a little bit. Another game you can play are these sort of compromise temperaments where you you might pick a you know three limit just temperament and then start sort of stretching intervals between that and equal temperament to try to get things to come out right and that is you know that all these compromises are possible and they were used a lot as Brian says, in the Baroque period and a, late, a little later than that. So, yeah, by the start of the uh, 1800s, not coincidentally, the start of the Industrial Revolution, we were off on sort of all equal temperament all the time kind of thing. And most all popular music and most classical music still uses equal temperament. There's obviously composers experimenting constantly with other things, but it is the gold standard at this point. There are games you can play with dividing up the scale even more, and no, nobody told us we had to divide the, the octave into 12 tones in the first place. The more tones you divide the octave into, the more that you can have some notes that have very small whole number ratios. But on the other hand, the more you divide it up, the more notes per octave you have to cope with, and music gets really complicated to work with. And I think that, you know, there are some cool instruments out there that use fancy equal division tunings, and yet they aren't in heavy use at this point. So, and you know, at some point you say, well, wait, this whole octave game, nobody made us do this. We could absolutely pick whatever notes we want to have, right? And that's cool. The, but, there again, you run up against dissonance as a thing, whether it's by ear training or by nature, no one really knows how to divide it up. And you run into the thing that's definitely by ear training of, to Western ears, weird scales sound really weird. That music's hard to listen to because your brain's really uncomfortable with it. 
I suppose that if you listen to enough of it, you eventually get accommodated to it, but I've never gone there and I don't know anybody personally who's ever gone there. That's that's getting off into really abstract music territory. And again, everything I say in this course pretty much is about Western music. I know very, very little about non-Western music and not even going to speak to it. The It's easy enough, and if you look at our FM synthesizer, fun MIDI synthesizer that's in the sound repos, I've added just tunings to it, and you can play with them. You can just turn them on and go however you want. But... We can go beyond that. Honestly. Oh, yeah. So I should say really quickly, tuning files are a thing. Uh, full keyboard micro tuning is a thing. MIDI has a standard for that. Many synthesizers allow a lot of it. And so if you're building synthesizers, it would be great if you gave everybody the tools they need to be able to pick whatever tuning they want for their keyboard or whatever and have the synthesizer do it. It's easy for the synthesizer builder and it gives a lot of control to the musician. I've never used these micro tuning formats, but they are out there. You should look into them if you're interested in this topic. And I'm not going to do a detailed thing today of all the tuning systems. Again, look at the notes if you really want to see all the things. And the MIDI tuning standard is a thing. It's a little awkward to work with. I actually found and reported some bugs in the MIDI tuning standard tables when I taught this course last time. So it's not a super widely used and explored document, uh, but it does provide the thing, the ability to tune from sort of the MIDI side to an, to an alternate temperament. And So if you can use that, you should. And if you're building a synthesizer and want to be able to accommodate micro tunings, this is the standard you should implement. And so yeah, alternate tunings, alternate temperaments, ability to adapt micro tunings, big strength of software. And the thing that I would comment on is that one of the sort of future topics that's been going on for 20 or 30 years, but people are still interested in exploring is there's a vision out there that's the best of all possible worlds in which if you listen to a barbershop quartet or a string, a, a violin quartet, those are instruments that, or any ensemble of, of voices or violins, those are instruments that don't have any fixed notes, right? I can sing anywhere I want at any time. I can play the violin anywhere I want at any time because there's no frets in the way. And so if I'm going to have that capability, what you'll find is that violinists or singers won't always play right on equal temperament. They, If you leave them alone, they will tend toward temperaments that are more like just temperaments. But the cool thing about being a violinist or being a singer is that I can adjust those temperaments so they're right no matter what chord I'm singing, no matter what intervals I have. I can play game, you know, I can literally sing a different D sharp if it's part of a G chord, G sharp chord as if it's part of a D chord. And that's powerful. That's a that's a powerful ability that it's interesting to be able to exploit. And in particular, the barbershop natural seventh is a total thing. Computers, you have the you have the vision at least of being able to have your instrument adjust to do that for you. Uh, it's easy to imagine and very hard to implement, as it turns out. A synthesizer that's constantly adjusting intervals as you play, so that the notes you're playing 
in succession or together all sound like the intervals are clean intervals and so that's a thing that's a thing that's a like i say been an active research area for a long time and that makes for some really fun instrumental stuff and it's something that you might consider building yourself so that's what i have for you uh i hope it was informative and i really really encourage you if you're the least bit interested to explore resources really starting with wikipedia and youtube and moving on to some really fancy papers out there i really encourage you to go out and listen to some of the differences between these kinds of music to see what you can hear and it's a rabbit hole that's really worth diving down a little bit again i hope everybody's doing well out there thanks much for listening and i will talk to you again soon